Welcome to Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, and this is our final show of the season. But we saved a couple of great guests for last. Today, you'll hear from him just a little bit. New athletic director, his first day on the job, Pete Bavacqua, joined me in the hot seat. It was a great conversation with Pete to talk about his career and ultimately how he's going to replace Jack Swarbrick, who will move on during the summer. A little bit later in the show, we talked to IndyCar driver James Rowe Jr. Really a fascinating conversation with him. He's in a partnership where he's going to wear a special Notre Dame helmet at one of the races coming up in May. He was on campus actually last week for the announcement of the soccer match that will be here in South Bend between Chelsea and Celtic. So we had a chance to talk to him about really his career, unique situation with being one of the few Irish IndyCar drivers. It was really fun catching up with him. Finally, to wrap up the show and the season, we talked to the head men's basketball coach, Micah Shrewsbury, kind of recapped what happened in D.C. and really previewed what's going to come in year two of the Micah Shrewsbury era. So it's a jam-packed show. Great guests, top to bottom. Let's get it started with Pete Bavacqua. Okay, this is our final episode of Wake Up the Echoes of the Year, and we have a very special guest I can't believe this is the first thing you're doing on your first day. Pete Bavacqua, new athletic director here at Notre Dame. Why is this the first thing you're doing on your first full day as athletic director? Why have you come on this show? Well, I mean, I think it reaches a lot of people, a lot of our Notre Dame fans and alums. So it's a great way uh, for them maybe to get to know me a little bit better, to talk about some of the uh, things we've been working on and maybe some of the things that we're going to be working on in the future. And it's, it's, it's great. I mean, I'm so... I'm so proud of Fighting Irish Media and everything that this team has built to really get the Notre Dame message out there to, to, to the nation, to our fans, to the fans of college sports. I really think it's one of the great media accomplishments in college sports over the course of the last decade or so. It's impressive. When I've talked to Jack, and I used to work full time at Fighting Irish Media, and I work with all these people that are putting on this show today in a different capacity, but he points to fighting Irish media is like really maybe his one of his biggest accomplishments while here. And, there, and there's a lot of accomplishments yeah. during Jack's tenure. What's been your impression of fighting Irish media while you weren't part of Notre Dame, seeing it from afar and how it's evolved over the years? And then I guess what excites you about its future going forward? Yeah, and I think I probably have a pretty unique perspective on it because um, I'm a Notre Dame alumnus and obviously a fan. You know, I've been a huge, Notre Dame has been a huge part of my life literally since I can remember. So I enjoyed fighting Irish media in that regard, when it started to take off. But then I also know it and learned it and and uh, partnered with it from my NBC days. Right. So when you, I just made, I, I think back to my time at NBC, it just, Fighting Irish Media made our lives so much easier. Mm-hmm. You don't find that at other places, not just at other colleges. You don't find that really at other professional sports teams or leagues. Uh, and we just knew we were in good hands and it saved us a lot of time, a lot of effort. And I, I've loved to see the progression of some people who've worked at Fighting Irish Media who've ended up at NBC Sports full time. I mean, it's this great, really wonderful uh, relationship that NBC has with Fighting Irish Media and Notre Dame. Yeah, there's amazing synergy that I've gotten to see being on campus and, and being involved with, with both parties at times. I want to go back. This is a Fighting Irish Media project product I was watching, uh, Benchwarmers. Did an interview with Jack. I think yeah. it was three or four years ago. It was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. Yeah. It was right right around. Up I think in the uh, Jack suite in, yeah. the, in, the, in the stadium. There's some great, I want to recommend anybody listening to this should go back and watch that. There's some great nuggets in there. I was listening to you talk about your journey to come to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And you said it was the only school on your list, only school you applied to. Why was that? Why why was this the only place you wanted to come? Yeah, I mean, I my father was a 55 grad. I, uh, we grew up in, in uh, suburban New York. I have four older sisters and my mom and dad uh, at the time. Both my parents, unfortunately, have passed away. But my father, I mean, Notre Dame was just, it was ever present in our lives. I, I said it before, if, like, I don't have a memory that doesn't have Notre Dame in it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether it's watching games growing up, I, I think back to summers when I was 12, 13, my dad and I would hop in the car and drive out here and watch practice. Yeah. And I remember I was the kid that was buying like hostess cupcakes and Twinkies and giving them to the players as they were leaving the practice field. I remember meeting Blair Keel and Eric Dorsey and 
you know, those things now would be totally uh, verboten, right? Because they, you can't eat that type of stuff. <laughs> right. you know, John Waggle and and uh, and Lauren Landau would be very annoyed with me. <laughs> but uh, but it was just it was it was it was Notre Dame, and it was it was everything. And uh, you know, I had my oldest sister went to St. Mary's. Uh, two of my sisters went to Notre Dame. One of my sister's husband is a professor, Jim Collins, thirty year plus professor at Notre Dame. So when it came time to me for me to apply to school, uh, it, it's all I ever thought about, hmm. and it's the only school I applied to. I applied early. Luckily, you know, lucky for me, I, I got in. It was a lot easier to get in in the late '80s than it is now. But you know, but I was accepted, and I never really even contemplated going to another school. Right. Uh, and and a lot of people ask me, boy, it was so hyped up. When you finally got to Notre Dame, could it possibly have lived up to those lofty expectations? And and it surpassed them. Yeah, I mean, those were four of the greatest years of my life for so many reasons. And uh, yeah, so it's always had uh, this special bond to me. And I remember some of the first conversations I had with Father John when I was at NBC uh, and getting to know him separate and apart from this process. You know, when I said, you know, other than my family, I mean, really, Notre Dame has always meant more to me than anything else. Well, it's been pretty cool. I mean, I, I didn't go here. I went to Pepperdine, as we were talking about before we started. So your wife went. My wife went yeah. here. And I've seen the impact it had on her. And just even when you work here, you, you get, I don't feel like it's the same as having gone here, but you get some of what you're talking about. When I hear people like you or Jack even, yes. <clears throat> and a host of others talk about it, you can feel that. I think the word you used uh, on the show is it's, it's pretty close to wholesome as it can be in college athletics. And I thought that was pretty neat. So you were here. I was looking this up too. Did you spend some time hunting on the football team? Is that true? So, so I was a, I was a pretty good high school athlete, right? Played football, basketball, a little bit of baseball, a lot of golf. So, you know, I was quarterback in the football team, and mm -hmm. point guard on the basketball team. So I was like, I was getting attention from small schools, Ivy League schools, a couple of schools in the in the Northeast, you know, smaller private schools. So. Yeah. You know, the concept of playing at Notre Dame was like, hey, you know, I'm decent, but not good enough to play at Notre Dame. Yeah. But I, I was always, I always had a, a good arm for a half decent quarterback. So I started working out in the spring of my freshman year with some of the receivers on the team and then had back surgery. So I'm like, okay, well, that's that. It's the end of that little, you know, half a second experiment. And my, one of my really good friends at Notre Dame, I lived in Soren for all four years, was Craig Hendrick. Okay. And, you know, Craig would punt and I would field the punts and throw them back to him. I start kicking them back to him. And he, he was just kind of said, hey, you have a pretty good leg. So I kind of went through the walk on process, mostly my the spring of junior year. OK, I worked out with the team the entire time, uh, you know, Craig Hendrick, Brent Bosnanski. And and it was a blast. And they sent me uh, to a punting camp at the University of Pittsburgh which was, which wow. I remember, is like a 150 degrees that entire week. And then my back okay. went again. So I've, I've had a series of back operations that kind of derailed a what would not have been a very promising <laughs> football career here. But it gave me a, a, a half a second glimpse. As I like to say, I was a, a small fly on the wall for a half a second. And just I think it allows me to even further appreciate the time and the effort that these student athletes put in. But what it also allowed me to do is become really lifelong friends with Coach Holtz. Okay. And so that's back. I graduated in 93, and those teams were, were loaded. You're, you're here in a, an amazing yeah, area. Loaded with yeah. talent. You know, became good friends with, with Michael Stonebreaker, who lived in Soren, and just, you know, all the, so, many, so many great memories and great guys. But uh, so fast, that was 1993 I graduated. I'm at the USGA running the U.S. Open for a bunch of years, but this would have been about 2007. And the 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 Oakmont chair of the U.S. Open was Bill Fallon, a Notre Dame grad. And he called me one day. I was back at USGA headquarters on the East Coast. And he goes, hey, I'm going to go hear Coach Holt speak tonight in, in Pittsburgh. I'll, I'll, I'll say hi if I see him. I said, oh, yeah, please do. So he calls me the next day, Bill Fallon, and he goes, yeah, I saw Coach Holtz after he spoke and I mentioned your name and Coach Holtz goes, Peep of Aqua, Peep of Aqua, the heart of a lion. <laughs> and I said, Phil, he said that about me? He goes, yeah, without skipping a beat. And I'm like, I, you know, I was like, wow, right? So that was 2007. <laughs> Fast forward to like 2015. I'm now CEO of the PGA of America and yeah. I have this radio show on Sirius, like State of Golf with yeah. Peep of Aqua. 
And I would have different people come in and co-host it with me. And I had Holt Stewart once. And we were down at the PGA show. So we were in Orlando and he lives in Lake Nona. So it was easy for him. And in a commercial break, I said, you know, I got to tell you, Coach Holtz, like something that's had a pretty profound impact on my life. And I start telling him the story and he starts laughing. And he goes, Pete, he goes, I've been coaching football for 50 years, thousands of kids. He goes, whenever somebody mentions a kid, I, I have absolutely no idea who it is. I say, the heart of a lion. <laughs> And I'm like, God, I'm like, I really wish you hadn't told me that. He's like, well, I can't say you were fast because maybe you're slow. I can't say you're big because maybe you were short. But I can say everybody had the heart of a lion. There's, so there's no way to fact that check kinda, that. That kind of <laughs> sums up my two and a half second, you know, failed effort at, at uh, participating in Notre Dame football. But it, but it, but it was a blast. And uh, and he's he's been he's been a great friend. And I got to see him when he was out on campus at the Ohio State game. And, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was funny. That's, I mean, and you could picture him, right? I mean, oh, his, yeah, his he's, brilliance in moments like that. I'm sure he sold it perfectly as only Coach Holtz. Yeah. I do want to talk about your background in golf. Yep. I, I, I love golf, huge golf fan. And the time you're at the USGA is like 2001 to 2012. Does that sound about right? Or is... Yeah, 2000, 2000 to 2011. Okay, so I started so right after Tiger at Pebble. Tiger runs away at Pebble, wins by 15 shots, kind of the greatest single yeah. major championship performance ever, bar none, not even close in my opinion. Okay, and then you get Tiger at Tour in 2008. 2008 against Rocco Mediate in the playoffs. So just, I would just love to hear you tell me some of the highlights of your time with the USGA. I mean, Tiger sticks out. It's kind of his heyday. Obviously, 2008, you know, doesn't win again until 19, but just... Yeah. While that's happening, what's happening in your eyes to golf? And, and when you're in the position you're in, you're trying to, I guess, maximize its impact on American golf, right? Just what was that experience? Yeah, like? well, I, you know, golf was always a big part of my life. Uh, when I was probably around 10, I said to my dad, hey, I'd love to love to learn to play golf. And my father played golf and then just stopped playing for a couple of 20 years, had children, got busy. Uh, and he said, well, the best way to learn how to play golf is to caddy. Mm. So he dropped me off at the local course we weren't members you know it was bedford golf and tennis and I, that was summer after fifth grade and i caddied there and worked there every summer through my first year of law school wow so caddy <clears throat> caddy master the kid in the golf shop so I just played a ton of golf and was always around it and you know went obviously went to Notre Dame, went to law school uh went to work at a firm in new york but always knew i wanted to get back into sports so that's how i got to the usga mm -hmm. first as in-house counsel and then you know then ran the us open for a bunch of years but it was a wonderful time for golf uh because you kind of the tiger f phenomenon started mm -hmm. and really kind of seeing that and when you think about tiger winning three straight usga junior ams three straight hams. I mean, mm. that is like people can't, you can't appreciate how difficult that is. And then to see him, I, I would say one of the great moments of my professional life was that 2002 U.S. Open at Beth Page mm -hmm. when Tiger won it. Uh, because Beth Page played a large part. I was going to ask about moving it to a, you know, yeah, a public venue. moving like it that. to a public venue. And that, that was the vision of David Fay, uh, who was the longtime executive director of the USGA and a person who I, I think very, very highly of and still a great friend. But to bring, you, you think about the U.S. Open, you think about Oakmont and Shinnecock and Marion and all of these great uh, traditional private clubs. And to bring it to a truly public venue i mean there's public venues and then there's public venues there's pebble beach yeah. and there's there's pinehurst but wasn't but, it 30 bucks to play before yeah, that but, but what was great about that page so my dad was a dentist so wednesdays were his day off and so in the summer wednesday was the day that he and i and my best friend larry yeah we would hop in a car at 6 a.m from bedford new york and drive out to beth page and we'd play the we'd wait we'd play the black horse at Beth Page, which is the U.S. Open yeah. course. We'd have lunch. We'd play either another eighteen holes or another nine holes on one of the other co courses. We'd run over to Jones Beach, jump in the ocean. They had these makeshift showers there. We would take showers, change, and hit this terrific now out of business steakhouse in the Bronx called Rotas. On the way back, have dinner at Rotas, and then get home at like midnight yeah my friend larry would sleep over and we'd go caddy the next day wow and we probably did that 30 times so i grew up playing beth page mm -hmm. 
And so as a kid playing Beth Page and then seeing the U.S. Open at Beth Page and the crowds and, you know, most U.S. Opens, you go around, you talk to the spectators and like they don't know what it means to hit a seven iron into a hole at that particular course. But mm -hmm. Beth Page, like everybody that was there had played it. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the volunteers, the security guards, the New York State police, the Farmingdale police. So it just had a whole different special feel to it. And then on top of that, to have Superman, Tiger Woods. Peak of his was, powers, was just too. Peak of his powers, yeah. yeah. He was invincible at that time. It, it's, uh, I remember <clears throat> my dad kind of made me, because I was re reluctant to read when I was in high school. It always felt like homework, but he had me read a book about that Beth Page Open, I think a couple years after, Feinstein. I think it was Feinstein, yeah. yeah, and it was just like, it's amazing. And now it's been 20 years, and I think yeah. they've been back to Beth Page for a PGA, right? Well, and, so, and US you know, we had the U.S. Open there in 2002, 2009, and then when I got to the PGA as CEO, like, one of the things I got after immediately, because the USJ hadn't re-signed Beth Page, so I worked with uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, to bring the, the PGA Championship and the Ryder Cup to Beth Page. Yeah. And it's there in 25, right? Yeah. yeah. So the the, U, the PGA Championship has already been there when, when Kepka won it. And then the Ryder Cup is going to be there in 25. And that is just going to be insanity. So I want to ask you about the Ryder Cup because you were – so you go from USGA to PGA of America in – I went from the USGA to Creative Artist Industry, okay. C, CAA, right. for about 18 months to kind of start their global golf program. Okay. And started to doing a lot of media rights analysis. Uh was enjoying it, but then the CEO uh, recruited me to come be their their this PGA recruited me to come be their CEO, and we and my wife and I and two kids at the time now three kids moved down to Florida and started at the PGA in uh, <clears throat> it would have been October of 2012. Twelve. So the Ryder Cup, as I see it now, but I'm a, I was growing up and people looked at it. As, I would hear people say it's like a glorified exhibition, and now uh, to me it's like maybe the biggest event in golf every two years yeah i think i mean in golf there's certainly men's golf right because you know, women's golf is is something that's so important to me and one of my proudest achievements is helping put the kpmg women's pga championship together okay. with it's funny how the world works with john Meyer, okay who was the ceo of kpmg at the time and is now going to be the new chairman of the of the truck board of trustees for notre dame yeah. as a good friend uh but i think on the men's side of the table it's the four majors in the Ryder Cup. Yeah. And I think if you polled the greatest players in the world, if you polled the golfing public, I think the two golf events that have separated themselves from everything else for very different reasons are the Masters and the Ryder Cup. Yeah. How do you think it got there? Because it takes <clears throat> buy-in from everyone. It takes people playing in the event and then organizing the event to make it happen. And, and it, it doesn't happen overnight. So how has it gotten there? I think it's a combination of individuals and moments. Uh, Seve Ballesteros, hmm. fundamental to the evolution of the Ryder Cup. You know, his passion, the way he rallied Team Europe, and then Kiowa. In, in 93? Yeah, you think when, when, you know, when that, that Ryder Cup came to Kiowa, those unbelievable moments, that kind of put the Ryder Cup into the stratosphere. Yeah. And if you talk to the best players in the United States and the best players who can make the Ryder Cup as part of Team Europe, <clears throat> they'll, they'll tell you to a, to a person, no other golf event elicits that type of pressure because it's a solitary sport, yeah. except for that Ryder Cup, when they're playing for their country, when they're playing for their teammates. You see the reactions, right? Mm -hmm. I think back to that interview with Rory McIlroy after the loss at Whistling Straits where he broke down into tears. Uh, there's nothing like it. And I, the, the, the probably the most compelling, enjoyable seven days of my professional career was the Ryder Cup at Hazeltine in 2016 because we had put the Ryder Cup task force together worked closely with Tiger and Phil <clears throat> and uh, Ray Floyd and others <clears throat> to really rethink how we had to approach the Ryder Cup yeah, and to give the players kind of a, a lowercase O kind of ownership of the process. And it all kind of came together. And mm -hmm. that, that was wonderful to see. But the Ryder Cup is special. And you take, you take everything that's wonderful about golf – and then you put it in the type of environment where all of a sudden it's like a Notre Dame football game. 
It'll be like and that at Beth Page. <laughs> it's it's going to be amazing at Beth Page. It might might, might be overboard at <laughs> Beth Page, but but it'll certainly be a lot of fun. I can't wait to see that. Uh, so then, from PJ of America, you end up at NBC. Yeah. What's that transition like? And then you get to NBC. Obviously, growing up the way you did and going to school here, right when the Notre Dame partnership launched. I'm sure that's a unique opportunity. Well, to I got I got to Notre Dame right when the NBC right. partnership right. launched. Yeah, it started in 1991. I started here. My my it would have been spring of '89 would have been my freshman year. Sure. So I kind of grew up with that partnership, which yeah. was really a, 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 a just a, unheard of at the time that a university would have its own television partner yeah. in NBC. You know, and and uh, and it's just been a wonderful 30 plus year partnership. That's that's going to continue. Yes. That's great. So, so when you get to NBC, what was the experience like being in charge of that department, knowing that Notre Dame was part of your, you know, the thing you're overseeing? Yeah, it meant a lot to me. And, and quite frankly, was one of the reasons I decided to do it. Uh, I loved my time at the PGA of America. And uh, I was there over six years. And uh, it was getting, you know, as much as I loved it, it was getting a little, I would say, repetitive. Sure. And the NBC opportunity came along uh, to go run NBC Sports. And I remember, you know, thinking about it, talking about it with my wife, Tiffany, about here's the ability to go take on this job in an industry that's going through so much change. This iconic blue chip brand and how, how does it need to change? How does it need to transform itself to stay competitive? Little did I know that I would be getting there during this moment of this kind of seismic shift from a cable, a broadcast cable one-two punch to a broadcast streaming and the power of sports. And then you think about the NBC Sports partners, uh, Notre Dame, of course, you know, Sunday Night Football and the NFL, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the Summer and Winter Olympics, you know, it's just kind of one after the other of these wonderful partnerships. And I Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my time at mm -hmm. NBC and learned so much, obviously, about the media industry and that side of the business. That is such a huge part of the college sports landscape. Yeah, I have to imagine it's it's good training ground for, for what you're going to do now. So <clears throat> let's cover what you've done the last, I guess, nine, has it been nine months or so since? Yeah, so I, I showed up on back on campus in July and, you know, credit to Notre Dame and and and, and particularly Father John and Jack Brennan, for being able to, to do this in a way with this transition, to have these, this preparation, these, these months to learn, to get to know everybody, to learn under Jack Swarbrick. And I know we're going to talk about Jack. Uh, and now to see what Notre Dame's doing with, with the transition from Father John to Father Bob. That doesn't happen in many places. It could be a lot rockier. It, could, yeah. it, it is a lot rockier <laughs> in most places yeah. for both roles, right? Yeah. For the athletic director role and the president's role, we, we see how those roles change. And, you know, it's a great credit to Notre Dame and the yeah. leadership at Notre Dame to do it in such a manner that's been incredibly beneficial. So what has Jack's impact been, not just in these nine months, I'm sure it's been super helpful and anything that stands out, love to hear. But you obviously worked with him directly when you're at NBC, and then I'm sure there was interactions from when prior to that. So just... When you evaluate what Jack has done here in his 16 years, whenever he steps away at the end of the summer, what comes to mind when you think of Jack and, and how beneficial has it been to learn from him? For yeah, well, I, I got to know Jack before my time at NBC uh, when I was at the PG of America. Okay. We, we built a, a, a partnership, a friendship. Uh, around that 2016 Ryder Cup, I came out to campus with the Ryder Cup and spent a lot of time with Jack. So I got to know him well. And then, of course worked very closely with Jack during my, my time at NBC sure. as, as one of our key partners. And, you know, the first, the, the first thing that you notice about Jack is he's, you know, just incredibly intelligent. Yeah. You know, I, you don't find people uh, smarter than Jack Swarbrick and, you know, and yet he, and he's so engaging. And so for me during my time at NBC, I was always amazed as both, you know, a Notre Dame alum, and a person in the media interest uh, industry and a partner of Notre Dame, how progressive he was. Hmm. You think about Notre Dame Stadium, you know, crossroads. You think about the ACC relationship. Think about fighting Irish media. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> just one great example. I came out here in June of, I'm going to say it was like June of maybe 19, or it was pre-COVID. Okay. 
to talk to Jack about, hey, would you ever consider, would Notre Dame ever consider allowing us to put a game exclusively on Peacock? Mm -hmm. And this isn't, you know, this isn't a baseball season or, you know, uh, uh, an NBA season with, uh, you know, so huge amount of games. You know, it's, you know, it's a, a limited, finite number of Notre Dame home games, and we wanted to get we'll put one of them on Peacock. Right. And this is at the early stages of Peacock, <clears throat> not even where Peacock is now with over 30, over 30 million subscribers. And I remember flying here, we were talking about, okay, how are you going to approach this? Because, you know, Jack's going to, he's got to say no, right? I mean, he can't possibly say yes. <laughs> And we, we went into uh, into the room, and, and I barely got the words out of my mouth. And Jack's like, yeah, let's do it. Well, and he's like, I don't want to be a follower there. I want to be a leader. Hmm. And it just, I think that is kind of tangible proof of who he is and how he thinks. Like, it would have been easy for him to say, well, we'll do it, but not exclusively. It has to be on NBC simultaneously, and then let's see how that goes, and maybe we'll ease into it. There's a million ways to try to split the baby there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he jumped into it feet first. And uh, and then, of course, it was the Toledo game. So I was a nervous wreck because, you know, you were thinking, all right, Notre Dame's going to beat Toledo by 40 points, and, you know, it was a nail-biter. Hey, Jack, is it the one with Jack Cohn's fingers? Just oh, like, exactly, like and I'm, I'm watching that game. I was out on the West Coast at an NFL trip, and I'm like, I'm not going to be allowed back on campus. Notre Dame. It's going to be the Peacock. Losing jinx, on Peacock. Right? Yeah, You're never the, coming back. This will be the end of Peacock and Notre Dame. But that's who he is. Like, he yeah. took that chance, and I think that's how he sees the world. And it's been he's been an unbelievable leader for Notre Dame. And, you know, not only <clears throat> I think what people probably can't fully appreciate, but I can because I see it, is the amount of respect he has in the industry. Hmm. When you yeah. talk to other commissioners, other ADs, uh, when you talk to the NCAA, when we go to Washington and meet with senators and, and Congress to talk about the NCAA landscape and NIL, he, he has their respect because he's an incredibly smart, thoughtful, strategic person. And and most importantly for me, I mean, the to be able to see him in action over the course of the last eight months or so, and really as to, as, as a teammate, you know, he invited me in, yeah. and I was a part of everything. And, you know, not only to learn in that regard, but also, you know, we, we were friends before this, but I think, well, you know, I know he would say the same thing if he was sitting here with us. Well, we'll be lifelong friends. I mean, he's just... He's a really fun, interesting person to be around, and his uh, what what he loves, whether it's music, obviously, you know, the the relationship he has with Kimberly and his kids is just amazing, and he, he's 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 a wonderful guy. Yeah, you led me towards one of my final questions. I want to ask you about kind of the current and future landscape of college athletics, and I think an area you pointed out that Jack's been, I think, really on the forefront of is both the CFP his yeah. involvement there. And, and the way he's been talking about NIL well before it became a mainstream thing, that he's had a, a very clear idea of what it should be like. And in talking with him about a couple maybe weeks ago, he's not crazy about how it's all played out here. So so I'm curious in your role, you're coming in. He's going out. So he gets to kind of say, hey, like this looks like it's yeah. chaos. See you later. <laughs> uh, what is your interpretation of the future of the CFP? And, and I think maybe more importantly, NIL, because there's <clears> – <throat> I don't know. There's lots of questions about what NIL looks like. How does Notre Dame sure. function in it? You're stepping into this role. This is, you know, early on in your tenure. But how do you see Notre Dame navigating those waters under your watch? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd love the chaos. Okay. And that's kind of one. Of, I mean, Notre Dame is what attracted me to this role. Right. But the, but the chaos did, too. Hmm. You know, knowing uh, that we're going to have to be you know, really be on our toes. We can't be caught flat footed. And Notre Dame has, you know, we're we're all biased here, right? You know, we think Notre Dame is is the best, and it is, but it has an unbelievable voice in this in these issues and in this space, and a very unique voice, and that's important. And I think, you know, I'll take the, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss both of those. The CFP, uh, that whole process, really dominated my life for the last three weeks. And but what's great about it, I mean, those were a series, an endless series of conversations between the four commissioners and me hmm. about, you know, what 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 this ought to look like. And, you know, obviously it's no secret that there was a, a power struggle move with the SEC and the Big Ten, particularly as it relates to the Big Twelve and the ACC and the G five conferences. But coming out of that, we're in a great spot. Mm -hmm. You know, both in terms of uh, revenue distribution and access. 
And you think with the new NBC deal, with the ACC network component of our media rights as it relates there with everything except football and, and hockey, obviously, we have an incredibly strong foundation with those two deals. With the CFP, you, know, you read these news stories and you read about these revenue percentages, but they're misleading. Because what they don't, when you read about Notre Dame getting 1% of the revenue distribution from the CFP, it doesn't tell the full story. Because the full story, those, those major conferences, they had to be made whole for their traditional bowl alignments. Hmm. So you think about the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl. Right. You know, Notre Dame doesn't have those tie-ins. So from a real apples to apples perspective, what our 1% translates to as a per team really establishes and further cements the value of Notre Dame in the college football landscape. Yeah. You know, we are one of the few things that truly move the needle. Mm -hmm. So we're happy with the revenue distribution. We're also happy with access. And when you think about where we are right now with Marcus going into his third year, with Mike Denbrock and Al Golden, with all of the support he has, uh, with the type of talent that we have, and then, you know, with the NBC deal and then this, this expansion of the CFP from four teams to 12 teams and then maybe 14 teams, which I think is likely, uh, we're in a good spot. Yeah. So I'm really happy about the CFP. And there's also some certainty for the next eight years yeah. with the new ESPN deal. Because if we had only finished the ESPN deal, the remaining two years, we don't know what the future would look like. Yeah. We'd be good. Because Notre Dame, again, moves the needle. Uh, but there would have been a lot of upheaval. Right. So I like the fact that particularly for us, because I think we're really well positioned right now, we have that eight years of certainty of the system. Mm -hmm. And that could change because, you know, things change. But I feel pretty good about that eight years. And then from NIL, I mean, Notre Dame was one of the the original yeah. supporters and proponents of of the concept and the theory behind NIL. And we know that's been uh, kind of become the Wild West. But I think, you know, what's important for, for people to understand is regardless of how you feel about NIL, you have to be aggressive. Hmm. You know, this is the landscape we're in. And we're going to be super aggressive in the NIL space. But we're going to do it in a Notre Dame way, right? you know, with the fund and the people that are, are really uh, developing and supporting fund. But when I talk to any of our coaches, I mean, NIL and what we need to do in the NIL space is part of the discussion. Where do I think it will head? <clears throat> I think it'll be further regulated from a combination of the NCAA and hopefully Congress. And that's a lot of the conversations we're having with Congress in D.C. is what those regulations ought to look like. Okay. I think if you were to read the tea leaves, there'll be a movement of much of the operations of NIL more in-house over the course of the next six months to a year. I think that will stop short, at least initially, of universities being able to directly compensate student-athletes. Uh, we could get there at some point. But what's important is to go back to what I said, we won't be caught flat-footed. We're going to be prepared. And we have a, I have a, a lot of people right now and a lot of our team is working on, okay, should this move in-house, how do we spring into action? Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to have that planned out. You can't, you can't lose time. You have to be the minute that that switch is flipped, we've mm -hmm. got to get after it because we have to stay aggressive in that space if we want to compete at the highest level and win national championships, which is, which is the goal. Yeah. I could talk about this all day with you, but we got to take a quick break and sure. we'll come right back. Okay, this is our From the Irish segment. It's brought to you by Tyrac.com. Before we ask the question from our listener, I have one yep. question I ask for every single guest that comes on this show that attended Notre Dame. Very simple question. Were you a North or South Dining Hall guy when you were on campus? Yeah, I would say almost 100% South Dining Hall. Okay, why is that? Because I lived in Soren. Okay. And, you, you know, you, you're I'm, at least I'm a creature of habit. And uh, I probably ate, 95% of my meals in the South Dining Hall with the same six or eight people, yeah. you know, for my four years, right? You'd run to Rocco's, you'd go to McCree's, you'd go to different places. Yeah. Uh, but 
you were just, I mean, it was, it was, you know, you, you, it's right roll, out, you roll out of bed yeah. and you go grab breakfast at the South Dining Hall. I was probably in the North Dining Hall over the course of my four years, maybe four or five times. Wow. I, I found in talking with athletes, coaches, Jack, yeah. uh, it Jack really, was a Howard guy, I think, right? I can't, I honestly can't remember which dining hall he said. Now. He's South. He's South. Yeah. I think he might have said yeah. South. That's right. I think he did say South. Um, I think Howard like faces the South dining hall. It's clearly for the people that were undergrads here, a proximity game. It's it's all about geography. You, if you're right next yeah. door, you're rolling out of bed because when you're in college, that's the thing. I've gone here as an employee, and I've talked to a few people that are not that didn't go undergrad, and I think we've maybe moved towards north. We like the symmetry of it, the the way it flows. You get your food. Have you been back to either one since you've been I've working been on to campus? the south? So I you haven't, haven't gone to north. I haven't got. I guess we yes. got to get you to north. I can't break the trend. <laughs> old old habits die hard. Right? Okay, in the next calendar year, we're going to get you to north. I want to get an evaluation from you because they've renovated it. It's a great experience. I, I'm a big north. I guy. will take you up on that. Okay, here's our question. It comes from Brian. He's from View Park, Alabama. He says. What is the most important aspect for the university that you'll be focusing on during your time as athletic leadership? So he wants to know how you're going to help the university. Yeah, well, one of the one of the parts of the role I truly enjoy the most and what attracted, well, one of the many things, but an important thing that brought me back to Notre Dame is, is the interaction with the student athletes. Okay. I mean, already in my eight months, you know, those, the conversations with those student athletes, uh, can be it can be about uh, college life it could be about what they're doing uh in their particular sport it can, but a lot of it's been career advice for post notre dame i just i love that aspect of it to me that's energizing it's motivational it just reminds me each and every day of what's great and special about notre dame i yeah. thrive off of that i think you know one of my main goals and probably among the most important, maybe the most important, because I think it's such a unique differentiator for Notre Dame. And I've said this to recruits that I've met with. You come to Notre Dame, you're a student athlete, and we can never lose sight of that. Mm. And that is becoming less and less the norm around the country. You walk on to many major universities with major sports programs, and they are campuses that are divided. It's the athletes over there and the students over there, and that's not Notre Dame. And when I'm talking to a, a you know a young man or a woman who's thinking about coming to Notre Dame to play whatever sport it might be, I always say, hey, you have to come into this with eyes wide open because mm. you're going to have every resource at your fingertips to just thrive athletically, and you're going to have those same resources to thrive academically. Yeah. And it's a one-two punch here. You're going to be an athlete and you're going to be a student. And you're going to have friends on your team. You're going to have friends on other teams. And if we're doing it right, you're going to have friends who've never picked up a ball in their entire lives. And that's part of the Notre Dame experience. Yeah. So in an ever-increasing world where major sports and major college sports are becoming you know, more and more separated from the rest... We have to do everything we can to maintain that student athlete experience here on campus. That's your point. When I talk to a lot of former student athletes, they refer back to all the friends they made outside of their teams, living yeah. in the dorms, whether it's being in the dining halls, you know, they're at each other's weddings. They're, there may be professional contacts down well, the road, too. And Tony, I mean, sports end. I mean, you yeah. know, whether they end in high school, whether they end after four years in Notre Dame, whether they end after, you know, 15 years in the NFL, they end. Yeah. And those relationships you make outside of sports, those are those are important. Mm -hmm. and, and it's and that student athlete integration, and we've talked more and more about it, goes both ways. Mm. You know, we have to make sure our student body is integrated with our student athletes and our student athletes are integrated with our student body. And the good news for Notre Dame is Notre Dame absolutely without a doubt does it better than any major university with major sports in the country, bar none. Yeah. I would have to agree. Uh, Pete, thanks for stopping by. It's a great conversation. I, I loved hearing all about your background. Anytime I see you, I'm going to pick your brain for another USGA story because <laughs> I loved hearing that. But good luck going forward. I'm excited to see you around campus. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Great. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. All right. Very special guest this week, James Rowe Jr. Got a 
a, a motorsport athlete on our set for the first time. So congratulations on that. Thank you. You're here the week that we recorded. It's a week ago on our show that we learned about the big soccer match here coming to South Bend. I want to talk all kinds of racing with yeah. you, but it's interesting because Celtic is one of the teams here. Yeah. And they gave you a jersey, I know, as well. Growing up, you're from Ireland. Mm -hmm. Just explain, you know, your relationship to Celtic growing up, what that means, and, and how neat it is that you're going to get a chance to see in about four months a soccer team from Ireland come play in Notre Dame Stadium. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me here. This is a uh, very cool, big fan of the show, so uh, pretty neat to be asked to be on this. Um, yeah, Celtic, uh, where to start? I think uh, every Irish kid growing up in Ireland, when it comes to soccer or football, you 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 have a soft spot for Celtic. Um, that's just a, a known fact. Um, there, there's something about that club and that team that you just never quit. You know, there, there's mm -hmm. no no die in them and actually very fitting around the whole fight in Irish side of things because that's just what, what Celtic's about. You know, they're uh, they're small, they're the mighty and they, they never give up. So been following them a long time and uh, yeah, to be here uh, on on the day that the game was, was announced and uh, meet some of my heroes was, was awesome. It's, it's pretty neat. And then I know we were talking before we started here. You actually went, was it your first Notre Dame game last year? That's right. Because you saw Notre Dame Wake Forest in Notre Dame Stadium. Yeah. So one, I want to know what that experience was like. But then two, just like envisioning that stadium yeah. with a Celtic match on it. What do you yeah. think that's going to be like as well? Just phenomenal. Um, it was my first college football game as well. So it was a lot of first Saturday. <laughs> and uh, obviously, you know, it's hard to put into words. Being Irish, you know, growing up in Ireland, moved to the U.S., uh, uh, 2018 and and you know you're proud about your Irish roots of course but when you when you go to an Notre Dame game you really see what it means to to be Irish and and just the whole the whole atmosphere that was there was was phenomenal couldn't really put it into into words I guess it's one of those experiences where you just got to go and 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 get a feel for it and uh, they won so uh, yeah it was it was a good day <laughs> you sound a lot like actually pretty much everyone I've talked to that goes to their first Notre Dame game they're just kind of like oh that. That exceeded yeah. all my expectations. No, for real. It's, there's something you can't describe, right? It's no. like the first time you see it, you have to go there to truly yeah. understand it. Yeah, right? I just couldn't believe that, you know, this is a uh, college. You know, like it, the, the production that's put on and the the fans, how loyal they all, you know, seem. And they're, like, they really rally behind it. And as, mm -hmm. as an athlete myself, you know, just trying to picture how does that feel? You know, there must be such an honor to be a player on that team. You know, mm -hmm. what that means, put on one of those gold helmets, all that goes with that. There's a... There's just a, such a uniqueness about it um, that is very, very special. I think, and I think it's special to uh, to this university and uh, the stadium. Yeah, the stadium was phenomenal. The only thing I can compare it to is Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You know, mm -hmm. there's there, as a driver or between other drivers, there's a, a saying and a feeling that you know you walk to the grid at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's like no other. There's 330,000 people around you and. Uh, uh, a sold out Notre Dame stadium, I think, uh, was probably the closest thing to that. Yeah. I want to go all the way back to when you were growing up. Yeah. And we have a lot of people listening to this. They're big football fans, uh -huh. basketball fans. I'm sure there are some motorsport fans, but yeah. they might not have as intimate a knowledge as maybe the avid fan. Yeah. So explain to those listening how you got into the sport you're in because yeah. it's not, I mean, to my understanding, there's not a ton of Irish drivers out <laughs> there. So how did you come to it? How'd you make the decision to make the move you yeah, made? And just yeah. what's your origin story in driving? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you the 100 mile an hour version, as, yeah, I, as I like to say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you, you're dead right. You know, the only Irish driver over here doing what we're doing, but taking it back a step. Um, grew up in Nace, County Kildare, Ireland, 20 minutes south of Dublin. Uh, fourth generation from that town. Family's been there for many, many years. And family business is a motor repair shop in, in our town. Very small town, 40,000 people in it. Um, so growing up, I always had an interest in cars from the family business, but my uncle, Michael, wrote had a professional career in motorsport in the 80s and 90s. He did like Le Mans 24-hour, you know, Indy 500, Daytona 24-hour, drove for many manufacturers. So merging the two together, being around cars from a very young age in the family business, and my uncle's own career um, naturally sparked an interest. But the sport is like no other. You know, there's massive upfront costs to get in. It's not like buying a fair pair of football boots or a baseball bat. And away you go, you got cars engines haulers mechanics crew chiefs uh you know the prep of it everything that goes with that so yeah. it's one thing having the interest and the intent to get involved but it comes a point it's like well okay well how do we get going and in ireland motorsports very small in the whole island of ireland there's only one racetrack really called mandelo park 
uh, happened to grow up two miles from it. So that probably had a little bit of a, a sway in, in my journey. But long story short, um, 90% of guys at any car level or Formula One level start go-karting at four or five years of age. But we didn't have the, the funding at the time to get involved. Uh, the intent and the interest was there, but just physically didn't have the, the upfront uh, cash to get going. So my dad and uncle turned around to me and said, here's the deal. You save up the money to purchase your car or go-kart, whatever that is. Uh, we have the resource in the family repair shop to work on the car and operate it. And how old are you at this point? Uh, I was 10 at okay. this point. <laughs> and um, then my uncle had the knowledge and expertise to engineer me and coach me. So it took me till I was 14 years of age to get the cash together. Um, so over this period, about three and a half years, to purchase my first race car and trailer to haul it. Um, got that from working summer jobs in the shop after school, you know, everything that goes with that. Purchased the cars, a Janetta Junior. It's a class for 14 to 17 year olds in Ireland. And um, we went out to our local racetrack, as I said, two miles from where I grew up and first race around the podium. And we're like, well, wow, I think we should take this. So your first series. race wasn't until you were 14 or so? Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, really? 14 years of age. Um, so very late starter yeah. in, in the scheme of things. And uh, then that day, you know, is, is when I got the bug, as they say. And uh, did two years in Ireland in, in that series with wins and lap records and then moved to the UK um, to race over there. Motorsports, very big in the United Kingdom. And I raced in a series called Formula Ford 600, which is the first step of open wheel racing. Open wheel racing being where the wheels are exposed, you know, not like covered up uh, yeah. with fenders. And again, had success over there with wins and lap records. In the meantime, I had to finish high school in, in Ireland. That was my mom's only rule. She said, you can race, you can do whatever, but you got to finish high school. Um, did that, and uh, we have what's called a leaving cert in Ireland, which is the final, and got my leaving certificate. And uh, then I always just had a goal and vision to come to America. Um, why is is <laughs> is the interesting topic? Because I'd never even stepped foot in this country. I was just a 18-year-old kid in Ireland, with a dream to get to the top of the motorsport ladder. And I looked at the two routes. So in Europe, you got Formula 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, and then here in America, you got uh, USF 2000, Indy Pro 2000, Indy Next, and then IndyCar, IndyCar being the, the pinnacle of US motorsport and obviously the home of the Indy 500, which is very well known here in, in the state of uh, Indiana, as you know. And uh, I looked at the two and basically in Europe, the model is quite different that if you perform or you succeed every year, there's no real reward. You essentially just get a clap on the back and, and good job, you know, and, and the driver and his team are left to look for funding to go to the next step. Okay. Because the business model, as I said, the driver and his team, like when I started, have to get the funding together to operate. Um, so look, man, the American route, you come over here, you've money for polls, wins, scholarships, there's an advancement funding, there's there was a commercial aspect to it. Yeah. So when I looked at the two, I said, all right, well, America, America it is. And, and obviously being Irish, uh, Irish in America certainly wasn't going to, going to hurt. And, uh, my family had, had, had great success when they lived here in, in the eighties, right. they, they lived in Dallas, Texas and, and worked there and loved it. So I just packed up my bags and, and, and moved to America. Um, that's a day I'll never forget. It was 18 years of age landing in Chicago. Here was the first, uh, airport I landed in and there was a team in Wisconsin called Arms of Motorsport that had a shootout um, with four drivers to get into the end, the first rung of that road to Indy Ladder in F2000 that I, that I referenced. So 18-year-old me rocked up to Wisconsin in February, freezing cold, never been in America, and uh, went to this shootout. And first and foremost, I was thinking, well, is this America? You know, this is not what I think <laughs> it should be because it was cold in Wisconsin. Dark, in Wisconsin all my friends were going to college in Ireland they were to start in college in like Trinity and DIT and all these places over there and uh anyway one thing led to another and, and did the shootout with the team there and that went very well yeah they offered me a deal and and uh signed for them in 2018 did that year and we wins lap records on my first year in America and uh the rest was really history it's been been super flat out journey from that point then got a scholarship from honda to race in us formula three which we did for for two years after that again won in it and then got onto the middle rung of uh, that indy car ladder system called indy pro 2000 actually with an irish team out of chicago again with success on it with, with polls and, and a win and then uh yeah got got a great opportunity to join andretti global um which is 
I guess still humbling to to this day. You know, the Andretti name in, in motorsport terms iconic is, is iconic, yeah. and uh, it's, you know, it's a brand known by seventy five percent of U.S. households. First Irish driver they ever signed. Um, on the Indy side of things, it's just it's, it's who you want to be with. So yeah, they offered a contract and we signed with them two years ago, and that's where I am now. So it's just been a, a wild journey to this point. Um, very very quick. Only recently. Uh, I saw a throwback. It was one of those, like, you know, Facebook memories, whatever. It was nine years ago last week. Um, God, I really got going. Yeah, I really wow. started. And, uh, and that's fast, right? I mean, when, yeah. cause we were talking, you said guys start when they're four or five. Yeah. I've watched, at least, I think a lot of people have, have watched Drive to Survive. Mm-hmm. And like, you get an idea of what it takes to maybe get to that level. Yeah. And they're all starting really young. And you're starting eight or nine years, at least yeah. behind the yeah. curve. Yeah. And you caught up. So, so how do you think you managed to, progress at the rate you did because mm-hmm. if everyone's starting 10 years mm-hmm. head start yeah I, I wouldn't pick you out of yeah. the line to, to yeah. track them down what was it about your ability or how you focused on your craft to let you catch up to yeah me? Good, good question i think first and foremost it's an obsession with the sport you know and that's that's just something i eat sleep and breathe it uh every aspect of it not just one aspect just across the board between you know driving reviewing stuff debriefs you know, the mechanical aspect, I probably had an advantage from growing up around a family repair shop. Right. So I actually came, even though I came in late, I came in with probably an advanced side on, on that. Um, and then just the whole aspect of the sport, you know, seven days a week, it's just all I think about every every day of the week. The minute I wake up in the morning to, to, to go to sleep at night and over a period of time, I think, um, certainly it's an Irish thing, you know, a work ethic is, is, sure. is, 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 no issue so when you pair the two together and have a vision it just it came together and look I, i've been very fortunate i i wouldn't be where i am today without many amazing people over over the journey and corporations and partners right. you know such as as topcon and and, and and corporations like that that give me massive massive support because ultimately that's what it's about at the end of the day um so yeah just just to answer your question it's been a lot of hard work and, and vision and and uh Never take a no for an answer. <laughs> I want to ask about the helmet. So yeah. this is a version that you wear, That's right? right yeah. But there's going to be a special version, right? That's right. Can you describe what the special version might be down the road? Because I know Notre Dame fans would be interested in it. Yeah. So that's my helmet that I that I run, you know, throughout the year. It's very Irish, as you can tell. You don't have to <laughs> guess where I'm from. And uh, there's a shamrock on the forefront, which is a bit of a trademark for my family. My uncle, when he raced back in the 80s, he had a green helmet with a shamrock on the forefront. So then when I went to get my first helmet painted that was it and and you know every driver's identity starts with their helmet that's sure. just that's your your mark so for me um you know being an irish guy over here racing on the indie scene uh huge fan of, of notre dame yeah i'm very excited to be running a notre dame team helmet at the indy gp this year okay. which is the second uh second weekend of may um at indianapolis motor speedway uh it's going to be a very unique helmet, um, very distinctive gold, and uh, let's say it'll be. Uh, you'll you'll see what it what it's what it's meant to be uh, when it when it pops out. But to tie the two together, the Notre Dame brand, you know my Irish roots, uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the state of Indiana, merging two together, just the the perfect the perfect storm to really uh, get going. So I think it'll be the fastest day a Notre Dame helmet has ever ever gone. <laughs> That's true. When they run the forty, they don't go as fast as you do. No. So explain to those again, and I'm kind of in this boat too. Yeah. I like to think I know a touch more than I did because I've watched a little bit of Netflix, but it's it's not enough. Mm. Explain then the difference between first explain how fast you go. Yeah. Explain the keys to what you do mm. when you are driving. Mm. And then maybe if someone has seen Netflix, the difference yeah. between IndyCar yeah. and F one yeah. just for the for the yeah. layman kind of coming yeah, to the sports yeah, yeah. and when they do tune tune in in May to watch you in the gold helmet, they have yeah. maybe a better understanding of what they should be looking at. Absolutely, for. yes. So um, just to just explain that the sports, first and foremost, the Formula One is global, permanent build race tracks everywhere they go. Um, and they do some street course races as well. So like Monaco, Monaco. is a street course race. And, and uh, I think, I believe Bacau is, and there's some others there, but they're permanent build race tracks. That, that's all they do. Whereas in... IndyCar, you have three sorts of circuit over the course of the year. So you have road courses, which are permanent build race tracks, such as Road America and Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, or the race track in which I'll be racing on it. And in Indy, Indy GP weekend is a permanent build race track. So permanent fixtures that change all year round. Then you got ovals, 
which is like the Indy 500, Texas Motor Speedway, right. St. Louis, Iowa. Um, and within ovals, then you got short track ovals and you got super speedway ovals. So in the Indy 500 is a super speedway. You know, it's flat out in quality four laps and you're averaging like 240 miles. Does it say hour. 240? Yeah. Um, and then you got street courses. So we do street course races, downtown races such as Nashville, St. Pete, you know, downtown Detroit where they shut down the city. So over the course of the season, comparing Formula One to IndyCar, IndyCar is much more diverse in the sense of what you got to accomplish over season. So to win in that series, you got to have a driver that that's adaptable to all these different kinds got of it. kinds of tracks. Um, but both are, are very competitive. You know, Formula One maybe uh, a little more predictable you know you you have max and red bull that are going to dominate everything and seems like it. yeah because they can design their own cars and, and put their own budget into it but an indy car it's a spec series so every team's given the exact same car oh, okay. it's a delara chassis and you have an option of a honda engine or chevy engine and that's it then so it's a it's everyone's given the same product so really then it boils down to a people's business i was going to ask so then does it come down do you think then IndyCar, mm-hmm. the way to in, mm-hmm. interpret it from my standpoint it's more about the team and the driver yeah. as opposed to which team and you see f1 is out spending or out innovating exactly. on the design of the car is that yeah. what i'm hearing so it's just that it's a completely different budget thing you know a formula one team's operating budget is probably 150 million bucks a year an indycar operating budget for years probably 10 to 14 million so sure. it's not even apples to apples um but having said that that's what makes indycar the best racing in the world because on any given Sunday you don't know who's going to win because uh, to to that point that we just discussed everyone has the exact same product so really it's a people's business no different than any line of business out there or sport for that matter you got to have the right people in the right place and and um, it's down to you and your engineer to find little tweaks here and there to 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 maximize the package on on the given day and uh, then a little bit of luck along the way so this leads me to a question that I wanted to ask mm-hmm. you. It's a very intangible question, so I guess take it, everyone. But I, I want you to try to explain it to me mm-hmm. and people listening. Like, what separates the good cr- drivers from the great drivers? What what is it? Because, like you said, if the playing yeah. field's more even, yeah. I think about just driving on the street, driving yeah. home. It's like you know, the good drivers, the ones that get there safely. There's obviously skill involved. But I just think if the cars are all the same, why aren't yeah. you guys all driving the same speed? Yeah. So, what separates the good from great drivers? Really, it's a feel thing, you know, um, and an understanding of, of what's needed. But but being an Andretti driver, I get to hear some Mario Andretti quotes, you know, every now and then. And Mario said something once that, that's very relatable. He said, the difference between the good and the great in motorsport is the the top guy, whoever's on pole, will be the guy who could create the thinnest line between I've got it and it's got me. So if you think about, like, Driving flat out on the limit, going into, you know, at Indy GP, we're going to turn one, uh, 185 miles an hour, breaking at the three board. And when you come in at 185 miles an hour, as we're talking like inches is what we're, we're, we're dealing with when it comes to braking or turning points. The whole field of 20 cars over a two and a half mile lap will be covered by. 0.7 of a second in qualifying so you can try and stop 0.7 on your watch it's not humanly possible so when you start dealing with those speeds those numbers tens and milliseconds of of, of of a difference between cars it's very easy to overdo it and then it's also very easy to underdo it and, and lose a tent or two so whoever can like close that gap and be, be the thinnest line between I've got it it's got me because you go a little bit over it you're going straight on you know you're yeah. not stopping up because uh, the end of the day it's physics it there's only so much that that car can do so mm-hmm. that's the separating factor and then um you know obviously uh nerves and and, and a little bravery every now and then uh, doesn't hurt last one i have is just kind of about your relationship with notre dame yeah uh obviously football game sounds like mm-hmm. had a great impact mm-hmm. but i know down the road you're thinking maybe this could be a place for you what about notre dame excites you what do you hope to do down the road uh, yeah, you know, there's there's many things that excites me about this place. I think it's where you start, but but as I said, going back to the start, being Irish, um, growing up in Ireland, you don't actually realize what it means to be Irish until you come over here and 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 seeing this university, you know, Shamrock, go Irish, the whole aspect of that is is something that just excites me. But for me, you know, I've been very lucky that I've had great mentors on the business side of things, and the business side of motorsport has has been has been a strong point for us but leading to that i'd love to do a an executive mba here at some point and i think it'd be the perfect tie-in for me to 
advance my career, you know, when the timing's right. Um, and also merge, as I said, that business side of motorsport yeah. and develop in other areas too would be be pretty neat. I didn't go to college yet. You know, I left Ireland after high school and, and I've been into college life. Um, so <laughs> to go to, to, to come to a place as prestigious as this and uh, so much relevance to, to what we're doing and, and complete that would be uh, would be an honor. Yeah. Well, if you're back on campus, you always have a spot. Welcome on this show. Love to talk to you. But good luck with everything Thank going you. forward. I hope to see you in the Indy 500. Tonight. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Here we are. Final segment of the year on Wake Up the Echoes. I can't think of a better, I'm not going to call you a guest, co-host at this point, Micah Shrewsbury. Good to have you back. I don't think we've talked really since the end of the basketball season. Uh, let's just recap the end of the season real quick. I thought that the trip to D.C., second game didn't go the way you wanted to, but I thought it was really important to get that win against Georgia Tech. What did you take away from the trip to D.C.? How important was it for you guys to perform the way you did against Georgia Tech in game one? Yeah, I, I thought we um, – I thought our guys were really ready to play. Mm. I think they were fired up to play. You know, we started the game playing really well yeah. um, and played probably – you know, three fourths of the game pretty well, uh, or a little, maybe a little over half, sixty yeah. percent. But uh, like for an environment like that, for a conference tournament like that, where it's you know backs against the wall, season's over. If you don't win, uh, I thought we we played, we were ready to go, mm -hmm. and that's a credit to our guys. Sir, um, you know, a lot of teams can just pack it in at that point and. Like they might fight for a little bit and then they're like, all right, we're done. Like mm -hmm. season's over. Um, but they were ready to go. They were ready to fight. And uh, it was, it was great to see. I thought we played really well for good, good amount of that game. Handled adversity well too. When the lead went away, didn't panic and, and made some big plays late. We also haven't talked since Marcus was named third team, all ACC rookie of the year in the conference, just on this show. I don't know, especially seeing the way the ACC's played over the last week in the tournament, it just validated to me how great his season was. But what was the significance of him getting that recognition? I know it came out when we were out in D.C., but now that a couple weeks have gone by, just how important was that for him and for the program to see that recognition? Yeah, it, it just a lot of, um, you know, a lot of hours that he's put in, right? Like, um, but also showing growth, you know, throughout the entire season, mm -hmm. but um, some durability throughout the season, right? To be able to play the amount of minutes that he played and put up the the numbers that he did, right? you know, that's a credit to not only him preparing himself for this season, but you know, our our Greg Miskinis, like yeah, um, Nixon, like that group there that that really helped him stay on the court uh, an entire season. So, you know, in one of the best leagues in the country uh, for a freshman to be third team all league um and you know we're not at the top of the league is is pretty unprecedented yeah so you mentioned one of the best leagues in the country the tournament is now down to the sweet 16 as you record this i've of course like everybody in the country's been watching the last week acc performed pretty well in the conference i think they have the most sweet 16 teams left from your standpoint just what have you observed does it make you think anything differently about the conference i think it's maybe the best conference in the country but then also seeing clemson and then even nc state a team you guys you know clemson team to beat nc state's team really could have beat here does that help you when you're talking to your team or when you're just thinking about guys we have what it takes to compete with teams that are making it to the second weekend this should give us kind of the blueprint for what it takes going forward i think it it validates some of your wins okay um but it also gives you motivation as well to look and see. It's like, man, we were right there with this team or, or close with this team. Like, I thought we played Duke, you know, well at home, you know, not so well on the road. But, like, you know, these teams are in the Sweet 16. And it shows our conference. It shows the power and strength of our conference that, uh, you know, it, it's just a dogfight every single night, right? Yeah. Like, no matter who you're playing. And, uh you know, people talk about the the strength of the league, and it's like strong at the top, maybe not as good at the bottom. But like, even the teams that you know were were closer to the bottom, like you know Boston College playing, going and playing well in the in the NIT, and Wake mm -hmm. Forest, uh, you know, won their first game in the NIT, but you know was now down a player, so they ended up getting beat. But like, 
the the whole strength of the league is showing well um, in these kind of postseason performances. Yeah, the NC State run has really kind of opened my eyes. I mean, you're right there with that team, and if you get hot and win your tournament, you can you can do anything. It's also crazy to see Auburn, South Carolina, Marquette. All in the tournament. Just the schedule you guys played was pretty darn good this year. We saw yeah, some yeah. good teams along the way. Off season, first full off season in South Bend for you. I want to kind of approach it just from where we are in college basketball and and get your take on it because we haven't talked about it much because you're in the season in the mix. But now you're in this unique area where I don't know. I mean, it's pretty new. What's going on now, right? What are the challenges as the head coach with I guess all the potential movement with the portal? with NIL, just how do you see the landscape from your eyes and what are the things you have to focus on here in the months of March, April, May, until you get truly into the next season? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge now, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, But you know, it's, it's what you sign up for, right? So you either have to adapt or like, you know, not gonna have a good program, right? Then those are the things that um, you have to do. You got to adjust to the times, like, even if you don't like what's going on currently. So, um, I don't know. I think, you know, you go from being in constant coaching mode to now moving into GM mode right. is what happens, right? But um, having guys on staff, like having somebody like Brian Snow that that is constantly monitoring what's going on in the college basketball world throughout the season. Right. You can't get to you can't be like me where you're just locked in on the season and the season ends and you're like, OK, what's next? Like you got to have somebody that's constantly surveying what's going on mm-hmm. um, around the country. Like, what are you hearing? What like? Because that's the thing that like, you know, as a as a old school kind of purist, like. I hate like the 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 kind of tampering that's going on um is that like a text message like what's the you know well i you know it's not really right you can't really like so it's a a text you can go back and find right okay it's easy to go back and check those but like um you know there's a lot of different ways that people are trying to get to your players okay um like just to hey like if if this happened you know or just putting it out there, ideas out there to maybe it's high school coaches, AAU coaches, like people around them, whatever it may be, like that's what this has come to, right? You yeah. you really just have to be – you have to you have to feel good about the relationships that you build with them throughout the recruiting period, uh, throughout the time they're with you, um, to just say like, all right, if, if there's a better situation out there for you, like, you know, I guess, I guess it's a better situation, but yeah. we did everything possible, you know, for a player while he's here yeah, to feel good about, you know, what's going on. So does it feel then like that's changed the dynamic between, I think I've heard other people talk about this, like it almost gets harder in some cases, maybe it hasn't for you, but like it can create an, an dynamic where it's harder to coach players because the whole time you're coaching them, it can be in the back of a coach's head if I get on this guy too much or I bench him or I, whatever it may be, this might be the thing that when March 15th rolls around, they're thinking, you know what? I've had enough of that. I'm going somewhere else. Is is that, is that an added challenge to this whole thing? It, uh, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, it is. Yeah. Um, now like it's not a challenge for me. Sure. Right? Like, oh yeah. I'm, I'm not coaching. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I, I signed up when, when, when I'm, talking to you and I'm talking to your parents, like I'm a coach and I'm gonna hold you accountable. Right. Right. And like at the end of the day, it's going to make you a better player. Um, might not always like it. Right. Yeah. Like, but like I'm trying to help you get better. That's all I care about. Like I want to win games. I'm going to make you a better player and a better person. And I'm going to do that by holding you accountable and by coaching. Like the best players want to be coached. Sure. Like, you get to the next level and that, you know, if it, had experience at the next level. Um, those guys want to be coached, right? Like, uh, so you got to take two coaching. You got to understand what's trying to happen. And maybe it's the age gap that, that guys, you know, younger guys or older guys, guys in college quite don't quite understand yet. It's like, 
you know, this guy that's holding me accountable is trying to help me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, cause I've seen what, what's going to work and what's not going to work yeah. when you get to the NBA. Like I can, I can tell you that for a fact like, yeah. that ain't going to work mm-hmm. or that'll work. Need more of this and less of this. And, um, you know, you can take that advice and do what, do with it what you want. Yeah. I, I, it's fascinating because a couple things here. One, whenever I, I talk to a lot of student athletes that have moved on or, or, or graduates and have done other things. And when they're older, they reflect back and almost all of them are like, yeah, like I didn't like some of that coaching, but I totally needed it. And so in the, so what's happening, I think in some cases, it's like guys or gals that are being coached can react to coaching. They don't like and flee when it's maybe the best thing for them. In, in some cases, uh, I just find that so interesting that in this day and age, that that can be a factor in, I, I in think, roster building too. I, I think there's some of that. And then there's also, um, you know, comparison is the thief of joy okay. right grass like, isn't always greener if i look out and like i see tony's um you know at a certain level of nil like oh i could probably get that as well when mm. tony might have something that you don't have right like like you know you you can look and say i'm the same as tony but you're not the same as tony right so like yeah. Um, yeah, you start to look around and compare to what other people have. You miss out on what you have, mm-hmm. you miss out on the, the really good things that are happening with you. Um, and it really kind of, it can ruin your experience when you start to compare your experience to other people. Yeah. And in talking with Pete, I think he's earlier in the show, he was saying he's eventually think there'll be more regulations, but right now it's, you've been in the NBA too. There's no salary cap. There's no, uh, length of term on contracts or scholar is just it's kind of all up in the air right now which i'm sure makes it tricky for for someone like you. i i go back and i think about um kevin durant was a free agent when when i was in boston 16 right? when he went to the warriors yeah like he like everybody knew he was going to be a free agent like right yeah. like the whole world knew yeah. they're like okay kevin durant's contract is about to come up here and like Here's what you make at his level as a player, right? So, like, teams prepared for that. Like, they, like, for years, like, okay, Clear we got to move. Space. We have to move off this guy. We got to get here. We got to get to this salary level. And, like, all right, here we go. Like, um, and Kevin Durant knew also, hey, here are four to five teams that I'm going to meet with. And this is who fits, like, me as a player, the city whatever have and my chance to win a championship everything else I like right now it's it's um it's nothing like that <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's thousands of players right yeah i mean it's like nba in one off season i think the most guys that could be up are maybe maybe a hundred guys are up on their deals yeah. now, the deals have gotten shorter now but like back then and if, of the guys that are really commanding a, a market it's like six guys a summer and there's a it's yeah it, it is, um, you really just, like for us as coaches now, we're like, you know, getting used to it a little bit. But It's like, okay, there's different waves that are going to happen of players, right? Like immediately, right? People whose seasons are over, there's a bunch of people going to go in the transfer portal. Right. And NCAA tournament starts and teams get beat, right? So like. Here comes another wave. By the wave of, there's going to be a wave of players here yeah. in this week coming up. And then, um as the next rounds end, right, in the, the Sweet 16, the mm-hmm. Elite Eight, like, you think about that, and it's, you know, probably, you know, not as much after the Final Four because there's not as many teams playing, but somebody from a Final Four team's transferring. Sure, right? yeah. And, like, um, so, yeah, there's, like, different time periods that things are happening. And then once school ends and people are graduating or not, there's another wave of, that might trickle out. So you just got to be ready to get your surfboard. <laughs> That's a good one. Right, right uh, wave. I like that. Let's shift back to year one. This is our coldest moment of the week segment or question. As always, it's presented by Yeti, as you know. Um, I want to think back to this season. Is there a coldest moment that comes up? Let's just say whether on the floor for the team or maybe away from the floor. I, I can think of some of the dances. They were pretty cold in the locker room comes to mind. But when you think about year one, is there a coldest moment that comes to mind for you? Oh, man. Um it can be multiple too. There can be things you want to just yeah, highlight. I, I don't like. 
I don't know if I can just think of one coldest moment, right? Like there, there's moments that happen that they might not even be, you know, like great things. Like, like I sure you can go back and think about different moments, right? That, um, uh, like Marcus getting a stop against uh, Oklahoma State and forcing the turnover, yeah. right? And like the celebration after that, like just the guys' faces on the court after we lost seven straight and like beaten, dribbling the clock out against Virginia Tech, okay. right? Like that, like you know, you see the joy and all the hard work that they put in, and like you know, the relief and the joy that they had like that for me was like really, really cool moment. Like there were some others, um, that were probably like really enjoyable yeah. or a lot better that, you know, I don't even think about or remember right mm-hmm. now. So, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to compile a, a bunch of coldest moments in the year to come. Yeah. Uh, but we'll save those from this year. I, you know, coldest moment Okay, for me, uh, probably the taste test. Oh. Although I didn't, I didn't do well. I didn't do well. They were cold though. Pretty cold moment. Good ice. Right? Good, yeah. We yeah, followed yeah, your yeah. direction with the ice. Yeah, that was a great. That's probably my the the shows. That's the coldest moment, moment on this show. Hi, yeah, hundred uh, percent. I think I think I aced that right. I think I aced. That. I think you did. Yeah, <laughs> I you had the answers on the back. I, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. the I've seen the outtakes. <laughs> um, cold um, cold moment for me. I'm take a turn here, but this is what the last season's for. Your playlists at shoot around mm-hmm. that is speaking my language. So I just want to know, like, we didn't get to dive into it too much uh, when we were talking at shoot around, but like, who is on your playlist? Because all, all I heard, like, I heard Ti, I heard Jeezy, uh, maybe like maybe Roscoe Dash is in there a little bit. I don't know. He's maybe part of No Hands, Waka Flocka. Like, who who's on that playlist? Can I can I just know who, when you get the, I, get the yeah. ox? Who's on your playlist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I am. I always go back to Tupac, right? Like okay. that's favorite favorite artist all time. Um, so I always go back there, and then you know you got to mix in. Then I go kind of eras, like all right, now let's let's throw some Biggie in there with it as well. Okay. Um, those were kind of you know high school, early college. Then you'll mix in some Outkast. Okay. Um, so let those kind of play, and then it starts to go into like okay, I've been coaching for a long time. So these guys, they keep me young, right? I got to stay like, I got to know what's, what's going on. Like, what are they listening to? Right. Right? So knowing who different people are. So, um, that's where you'll hear, you'll hear some, some TI or you'll hear some Jeezy, uh, different things from probably when I was coaching, like different things that people were listening to at the time okay. at different places. Um, Drake, always some Drake, some Jay-Z. Um, and it's funny, like, like if I'm in my car, like all I really listen to is like gospel music. That's what Niel said. Yeah. Niel's the same way. She said, I listen to gospel like music. Like in my in car, car by myself. That's like all I listen to is gospel music. Okay. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, when I get to work and when I'm getting ready for a game or practice, whatever, then I go back to whatever the guys are listening to. Yeah. And like, and I, yeah, I, I know the words. I know them all. Like the new stuff too? Like th- this, uh, th- see, this no. is where I'm struggling yeah, yeah, yeah. because the mumble and the, I just, I'm worried about this next generation of mm-hmm. players you're coaching. Cause I just think they're coming up on the wrong stuff. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I can't, maybe that's just me getting old, but I don't know about the new <laughs> stuff. I don't know what they're talking about. I, I yeah. think I, just well, you just hear a TIB, yeah. no. but those guys, they resonate. So like you were playing that at shoot around and I'm like, yes, these are still great pregame warm up mm-hmm. songs. Now it's like, yeah. Like that's not. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's just not getting me ready for the game, right? What song was that? <laughs> they're, uh, they're they're like you know I let those guys like whatever in pregame and they'll listen to whatever in the locker room and and like I'll walk in and it's like like it, sometimes it sometimes it'll get me like okay. I, I know like okay. I'm like, all right, this this is getting me ready to play, okay. right? So, uh, but I don't know who's who. Yeah. I can't tell. Like, there was distinct voices back then. I, I don't know who's who, and I'm not listening. I'm not listening to it all the time, so I can't right. tell the difference between uh, Lil Durk or Gunna or like. They're all the same. Whoever. Yeah. 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 Uh, year one, just is there something about Notre Dame 
that you learned this year? I, I've heard you talk when you when you announced and you spoke about this place with great reverence and talk about football growing up, but working here, being in it, is there something you took away from year one maybe that surprised you, didn't expect being on this campus and, and coming to work here every day? Um, I don't know if there's anything that surprised me, right? Like uh, there were, you know, I had high expectations mm-hmm. um, of the place. Okay. But you know, I think, you know, really just the general support, right, like of – um, you know, the crowds that, that came to the game, the people on campus, uh, people that appreciated, like, even though we weren't having a great season, right, they were sticking with us, but they they appreciated how we were playing and what we were doing, yeah. right? That's what I hear the most is, like, uh, like, we loved watching you guys play. We loved watching you guys compete. We love the direction of the program and where it's going. And uh, as I'm, like, going around and, you know, just trying to, to be a part of the be a part of the community and yeah. be a part of the campus community in, in whatever way possible. Um, I mean, I want – I love feeling a part of it, right? That That's the biggest thing. It's like yeah. for a school of this size, I like I can be a part of, of like, what people are doing. Yeah. And well, that's speaking to the, you know, first year class of 2027, just on a random Saturday, off day Saturday, just popping in and meeting with some students or like, you know, being a judge for the Tom squad, like whatever it might be. Wow. Like, do it all. I love doing it. Yeah. Right. Like just for just to feel a part of of the university and, and Notre Dame and what we're doing. Yeah. To, to your point people would come to me and talk about this season occasionally and you probably wouldn't want to hear this while the season wasn't going the way you wanted to, but even in the losses, it was still a fun follow. It was still an enjoyable team to watch. It was it, being an easy team to root for goes a long way. Even when, when things weren't going the way you went on the scoreboard, I thought that's what really resonated with fans is the sense that I got uh, two questions, two more, and then you're done. Uh, first one is really a question for you. Do you have any questions for me? Are there things lingering? Are there things you want to get off your chest? Anything? It doesn't have to be a question. It can be a uh, a complaint. Is yeah. there anything lingering? Because I know we took care of the DAP last week. I think we're good. We'll we just, did. We'll knock yeah, and we get out of that. here. But yeah. is there anything just – you had to spend a lot of time with me this year. I want to make sure that the opportunity is available for you to turn it on me. No, we, we have to uh, – I think going into, going into next year is, you know, a couple of things. Okay. Like one uh, – shoot around you got to remember where if we win you got to remember where we do it right so we can go to the same spot i'm not i'm not like uh i'm not quite like danny hurley like i read the stuff the other day about danny hurley dresses head to toe like same underwear shirt suit every game says his wife has a portable washing machine and washes his clothes on the like like i'm not that superstitious okay but if we get a dub, like we I'm, we're same gonna spot. do, yeah, we're going back to the same spot. That was on. We're gonna, we're gonna run that back. Okay. So, and sometimes I don't remember where we did. Sometimes I do. Uh, but that, I know there was a couple games where it was clear we should not go back to to where we were. Yes, <laughs> we were good yes. about that. Let's never do that again. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not do shoot around. Right, let's not do pregame talk at North Carolina or with or whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fair. Yeah, uh, but no, uh, like that that part, like we're going. Like our chemistry is just growing. It growing. It's gonna keep getting better. That, that's the part of it that I love. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I'm I'm cool with it. I, I'm like, um, if Tay would have got a tech like from Duncan and and doing the Sean Kemp, I, I'd have ran over and did the our fist bump okay. over with it. That'd have been exciting. To me. I'm gonna let him know because there was I think we talked about yeah, it was a uh, Clemson. Oh man, there was just a moment. And I just and. I know he's not thinking it, but in my head, I'm like, gosh, I hope it happens. And I hope he just flashes back. And if, if the two points yeah. come back on me, then I don't know, I'll still die happy. Cause I'll just be like, that'd be so good if he gets that. That would have been great. And we could have, um, just like Logan put the video up of me dancing to the, the viral video. If we would have got the Sean Kemp next to like next to Tay doing it. it it's oh, all worth it for content. Definitely would have been the coldest moment. <laughs> <laughs> would have been our coldest moment. Uh, okay, the last thing is just about what excites you about year two. Obviously, we just talked about all the 
uncertainty and this and that, but the thing, you know, for sure is that I think you're going to show up with a, a really good team, hungry, with a good amount of experience from this year. Everyone that, I'll, I'll tell you a little quick story. I was at dinner and th- this ha- happens rarely, but three people came up to me because they recognized me just from the games and they all came to talk about the basketball season. It was right after it ended and they were just so excited about year two. I'm excited about year two. I, I know you are. And it, we don't know exactly what it'll look like necessarily yet. But what about year two excites you the most? I think, uh, you know, the one thing is there's no guarantees, right? There's no guarantees that, that year two is going to be better than year one. It should be. Sure. Right? It should be. But there's no guarantees. So we have to work for it. We got to work the same exact way. But we got to work, like, even harder than we did. Because it's not like. You're gonna be able to sneak up on people, right? right? Like, you know, Clemson's like, "Hey, you're not getting us again, right?" Mm-hmm. Like, we fell for the trap last time. Like, there is no sneaking up on anybody. Um, so we got to prepare better. Uh, we got to be better as a group, and we got to work for it. Got to be hungry. Um, but like, the one thing that I talk to our guys about, and this is. This is something to to be excited about. And there's still a long way until May, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the transfer portal, you know, is is still open. And, um, you know, somebody could still fly out of it, right? Mm -hmm. You never know what's going to happen. But I talk to our guys about continuity. Mm -hmm. Like, who who can make a jump from one year to the next? And the teams that have done it, they have some continuity. And – um, we've talked about, you know, obviously after, after, uh, we played the Marquette game, like their continuity has been huge. They haven't lost people. They've been able to really build up towards these moments of having a really good team after this is probably year three of those guys together. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you look at some of these other programs, they're having success. Continuity is the key. Yeah. And if we can keep this group together, keep adding key pieces that, that supplement this group that make each other better. Um, we can keep making jumps. We can keep getting better. So um, I'm excited to, to have a group back. I'm excited to go into practice and say something and people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be so much fun. Like yeah. to say like a drill and everybody can just go to a place and, and know what we're doing. Yeah. So um, continuity is, is king in college basketball now. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. Uh, it's going to take a while. We've got to wait all the way till November. I know you guys will be working before then, but thanks for joining me this year. It was great to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you in year two. Can't wait. All right. That does it for this week and this season's Wake Up the Echoes. What a great year it was here. It was so fun to talk to all the different guests we had all season long. Thanks today to Micah Shrewsbury for joining us all year. Thanks to James Rowe Jr. And of course, thanks to new athletic director, Pete Bavacle. Before we wrap up this season, we have to give you the final tally. I told you last week we would get you the numbers and we have them for you today. In total, we voted 16 times on North versus South Dining Hall. I, as you know, am a North guy. I think these numbers are wrong. I think this is the wrong vote tally, but this is a free country. You're allowed to vote. Everyone voted with their conscience. 12 votes for South. Four, four clear-headed people voted for North. I think I'm the fifth vote. So we're going to call it 12 to 5 at the end of the year. I look forward to next season where we'll get a chance to get some maybe more level-headed people on this show to get some votes for North in season two we'll keep that tally going for as long as this show is running it was a great year on wake up the echoes thanks so much download subscribe we want to see you uh when we come around next year in the fall for season two but until we talk to you in the fall tony simeone saying wake up the echoes